control panel. So if you have questions, we can we can open your mic. We can open into people's individual mics if we need to. Also, I think it would be good. Let's start by just having you type your questions into the chat box. And my colleague, Steve Koji, will be monitoring that chat box. And what we'll do is we'll answer each question by demonstrating on screen how you do whatever it is the question is about. So, uh, Frank, can you, it looks to me like your, your microphone is, is muted on your end. Can you, oh, there you go. Frank, do you want to add a few words to our event tonight? Can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Does everyone else? Yeah. Type in the in the chat box if people can't hear. If you can't see uh, my screen and hear Frank, let us know. Type in your type in your chat box. All Frank. right. Well, while we're doing that, Michael, I want to welcome everybody to the UMUC session. Uh, the attendees for this session are people who are in ASCM 629, which is the uh, course that I teach, as well as ASCM 631. So there's a blend of people here. Some are doing uh, uh, an assignment called Cincinnati Seasonings. Uh, the others are uh, working on uh, an assignment called Collaborative Logistics. Tonight's webinar is more generalized. It's not going to necessarily deal with the specifics of, of uh, one or the other. Uh, it's going to be basically demonstrating some of the features uh, in SCM Globe that are relevant to both. And it's going to be driven by your questions. Uh, we purposely set this uh, webinar up for week three because during week two, uh, at least for ASCM 629, students began working with SCM Globe and uh, had the initial uh, assignment of trying to get their network to run for 30 days without stopping. Uh, my expectation is uh, doing that prompted a lot of questions about uh, not only how to get started, but also how to continue to improve the network so that's why we've scheduled for week three, because uh, this is your opportunity to focus on what you encountered uh, with that experience and uh, ask questions about that. So with that, Michael, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And uh, it sounds like you've got uh, the reins and, and everything under control. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> the famous last words, if I was to admit to that. But I think we have them reasonably under control, at least for the moment. So I, I think that, I mean, I can obviously, I have lots to talk about, but you want to guide me, everyone on this call, because I'll chew your ear off and not tell you what you really need to know. So let's start. Okay, I, I'm seeing some questions in the chat box. Steve? Natasha. Yeah, basically, yeah, we have a question here. Um, it says that uh, I had trouble with just accessing the online guide for the case study. Can you uh -huh. demonstrate how to pull up the guides? Okay, yeah, we can do that. So uh, when you go to scmglobe.com, and actually, you know what would be a good idea is you all are obviously at your computers, and in one window on the screen, you're seeing my screen. In another window, open up, you know, go go to SCM Globe right now in another window, and log on to your account. Go, just everyone should just go to scmglobe.com, like what you're seeing right now on my screen. I'll, I'll wait a moment for that. And when you get there, what you'll notice is that there's this big blue key here, Get Started Now, which will take you into the online guide. You'll also notice that there are these menu options across the top. And one, calls, one is called Online Guide. Actually, they'll all take you into the online guide. They'll just take you into different parts of it. 
but the online guide one, let's click on that. Go ahead and click on that. That's going to take you right to the main table of contents for the guide. We did a lot of work this last summer uh, improving the website and hopefully making the information easier to find and easier to use. So what you're seeing on, on all the pages of the online guide, you'll always see across the top this, this abbreviated menu. And then on most of the pages, if you look to the left, you'll see the detailed menu here horizontally. So um, we have organized the data into small little bite-sized pieces. There is a lot of information here. We don't expect you to learn it all. As a matter of fact, it would be a bad idea to try to learn it all. What we want you to do is learn enough to get started, and that's where the getting started. So if I was to want to know, gee, Mike, what do I do to get started? I would say go to the table of contents and click on getting started. And what you'll see really is the essence, and I'm, I'm guessing most of, if not all of you, have already gone through this. So I won't go through it again because you've already been there. But there are six steps. We know that a lot of people uh, check out step one or they already, you know, most, a lot of people can figure this out. But um, if, if you do need some help on purchasing, et cetera, et cetera, you've already done that. You've already activated your prepaid accounts. We can see from the page view statistics that a lot of people just go to step two and they watch the three videos and then they jump into it. And we're fine with that. We just want you to remember that when you start to feel frustrated, when you feel that, it always starts out, in me anyway, as first uh, doubt, then frustration, and then inevitably anger. And before you hit the anger stage, when you hit that frustration stage, even when you hit the doubt stage, remember, you can always go to the online guide, just like we did. Now, let me show you something else. How would I log in, Mike? How do I log in? Right. I click on the log in button. And... Then I click on log in. So I'm going to do that. When you come to, when you log on, you'll you'll see your account management screen. That's generally where you start. And then, how do I get help, or how do I find the online guide? Does anyone have an idea about how I might find one? Here I am. I'm in the app. Uh, this is worth a major gold star right now for the first person who types into the chat box. How would I find the online guide when I'm working inside of the SCM Globe app. Major gold star, promotion to Brigadier General. Does anyone want to give it a shot? All right, well, yeah, if you just click help, you will do work, you'll be right back there where we, you know, we clicked on the online guide. There we are. Everything is broken up into small pieces. Look through stuff. We have concentrated because we know that most people are basically looking at the, the introductory videos. So if I go to the video tutorials right there, here's the concentrated essence for those who are into concentrated essence. Here's the main idea. None of this will make sense unless you kind of get the hang of this notion of the four entities. We think they're, as Thomas Jefferson once said, self-evident. But that's what the whole thing is based on, is these four entities. Products, facilities, vehicles, and routes. You define them. You drag and drop to place them on a map of the world. That map is Google Maps and then you click simulate and it will run through the interactions that those four entities have. When you look at the three video tutorials, the first one is about eight, nine minutes. The other two are about four minutes. Uh, we know that a lot of people scan the videos. Just check out a little bit about, you know, that we've put a pithy paragraph underneath each of them. So for those who just want to get right down to it, it's right here. For those that want a little bit more information, that's what the other steps are in the getting started section. You know, creating a supply chain from scratch, running simulations, working with case studies. So 
15 to 30 minutes is going to is going to do the trick to get you started but you will need to know more as time goes on and we'll show you some of that this evening as you start to come become puzzled scratch your head um, and that turns into frustration please before you get the anger click on help all right mike um she's there the the, the specific uh, question that they're looking for here the answer to is how does she pull up the guide for the case study that she is working on in other words could, right. uh, let's do that could, i think let's yeah go to show them so, how to get there as we're scrolling down you know because it really is all here so I'm scrolling down and I'm looking at stuff. Uh, butterfly effect? No, nah, it doesn't sound like the guide that for a case study. No, I'm going to keep looking. All right, commercial supply chains. There it is. Cincinnati seasonings. That's the one of them. And the other group is working on collaborative supply chains. So I would pull up the introduction to Cincinnati seasonings by clicking on Cincinnati seasonings. And I don't know if, Frank, you can comment on this. Do you share the study guide or do you just have the students work off of the introduction that's online? Frank, are you? Oh, Look, it looks like you. Oh, there you go. All right. Yeah. Right. Frank, we don't hear you. Okay, well, um, I, I don't know if if uh, you sometimes your professor will share there is a, a study guide. Um, it was really written for the instructors. It's their call as to whether they share it out with the students or not. But the information you need to get started is right here. There's three challenges. You know, first of all, we know that, well, almost everybody starts out with. OK, um, Frank. Are you unmuted now? We don't hear you, Frank. Yeah, we're not hearing him. Uh, let me see. Okay. Audio, audios. He's talking. He thought he was yeah. on. Well, it shows yeah. that he's on. Right, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say, Frank. You could type into the chat box. We yeah, he did. Oh. he did. He did. So, yeah. um, Frank, we'll we'll see if we can address it later. I don't know what's wrong with their, with their sound. But what we'll do is... Uh, We'll move on to another question because we really don't know the answer to that one uh, in terms of what well, Frank I, is what expecting I, what I or say, how he has briefed them. If 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 you are if you are getting uh, if you getting a copy of the instructor study guide, it'll it'll come to you through UMUC's portal. If you are looking at the online introduction to that case, it's right here. Uh, just. Okay, so what was hey, that? Hey, Michael, this is, this is Jack Cromley. Can you hear me? Yep, I hear yes, you. Yes, I yep. can hear you. Okay, can you, can you talk a little bit about the uh, collaborative? Sure. Uh, yeah, the, the collaborative case study. So, you know, in addition to, to reading the getting started section, we always think that it's worthwhile. And it, 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 there's links throughout the getting started section. So uh, there's links to both Cincinnati and there's collaborative here. I'm going to click on collaborative. This is the one that is the uh, uh, ASCM 630, I believe. Uh, Jack, you're uh, one 631. Of the, 631. Yeah, 631. Okay. Yep. And so again, just like it did for Cincinnati, this every case has a central concept that's always at the top. There's a little background. This is actually a real company. If you've ever heard of this candy company, Just Born Candy, you'd probably be because you know of their little. On Easter, they have the, the little peeps, the little marshmallow peeps in various pastel colors that are kind of a, that's their trademark. So anyway, this is based on work done by a professor at Lehigh University who is right there in the area. And what they did was they converted, they basically, the, uh, Just Born and another company that we called Crunch Candy merged their supply chains in order to compete with their larger competitors, M&M, Mars, Hershey's. Uh, so it's you're basically now playing the role of someone who has been brought on to manage that merger. And again, you can read through here. I won't read it to you because it's all right there online. Here's your first challenge. You can see what it's, you know, what it's talked about. It's typically you want to get it to run for 30 days. 
then your second challenge is going to be now find keeping it, you know, find ways to keep it running while reducing operating and transportation costs, which is, hey, let's combine our distribution centers. Let's combine our delivery fleet, which is, of course, what they did, actually. And you're now making decisions about how to do that. And then there is a third challenge, which is now that we've got this new combined supply chain, both stores, you know, both companies begin growing their business, opening stores for the West. How are you going to handle that? So in a nutshell, that's what this is about. Now, Jack, I, um, you and also Jim Bryant are the two professors teaching the 631 course. And I don't know if you're if you're sharing the instructor study guides with your students or how you're handling. I do not plan to. Okay, well, I right, do not good. plan. Okay, good. And I think that's better because another thing that is really important to understand is that there are many ways to solve these problems. And this, you know, ban the thought of the right answer. Um, the world keeps changing, and answers themselves keep changing. Uh, however ban th another thought that all answers are equal because they're not. There are always better answers. And when you start playing with this, what you're going to see is the first challenge is we're just encouraging you to do whatever you think you need to do to make it work, run for 30 days. Because then you're going to start circling back and working on making it more efficient, expanding it, all of that. All of that is also exactly what you would be doing in the real world, and some of you probably are working already in logistics, supply chain management. Um, I hope you find that this tracks very closely. I've had a 30-year career in logistics myself, loved every minute of it. So this is really meant to mirror what you will really be doing or really are doing already, and there's a lot of ways to solve problems. There's no one absolute right answer. Everything changes as prices change, as new stores open up, all of that. So. Hey, Michael, right. okay. um, one, of my students, one of my students had a question about yeah. data analysis and how to determine a, uh, determine a cost, uh, i.e. profit loss. Do yeah. you want to talk about that? Yes, or? yes I do. I do. That's a great, that's a great question. Now, on, on both you're looking at my screen here, and I'm and I'm saying, you know, I'm rambling on, but I'm saying we have put links everywhere as well as the table of contents. Anyone, again, who wants to get an instant field promotion, what would you do? Is there a link somewhere on this screen that you can see that might give you information about analyzing simulation data? Um. What do you think? What do you think? Does someone want to take a guess, Ventura? Uh, what do you think? What should I do right now if the walls are closing in on me? <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take a risk and I'm gonna click on analyze. If I want to find out about analyzing the simulation data, clicking on analyzing simulation data is probably a good idea. So I'm gonna do that, and when I do that, it's gonna open up a page called analyzing simulation data. And if I start to scroll down, it's going to give me a quick read on here's how I can look at some of the on-screen displays. Because there is so much to know, what we've done, and when we say broken it up into small bite-sized pieces, uh, you know, if you, if you have some thoughts on how we can make things clearer, we always want to hear that. You're looking at the result now of, heck, about five years of experience, five years of feedback, much of that from UMUC students who are a tough lot, I might say, and thank you for, for kicking our butts and not letting us get in the way with anything. Um, so what you're seeing here, we're, we're trying to show with pictures. We're trying to keep the words to a minimum. We're trying to say what it is. <clears throat> I'm a logistics and IT guy. I have a lot of experience in both. I hate it when IT guys talk around and use a lot of BS words and use too many words to begin with. So we've really tried to talk like regular guys in logistics and keep to the point. So as you start to scroll down, you're going to see more information about how do I read the on-hand graphs. As I keep scrolling down, I am going to find a header called Download Simulation Data Spreadsheet Reporting Template, which is what you are going to wind up doing a lot of. And again, there's a step-by-step -step illustrated with screenshots, so I won't go through that because you can go through that. 
actually some of you should be you know checking it out right now on your own laptops um, we show now what the data that you download will look like and I'll do that in a moment we show how, how you want to you know you can let your sim run for you know 32 33 days you don't have to cut it off right at 30 uh, because then you just trim it so you trim your simulation data to 30 days these, this is basic, you know, spreadsheet 101 stuff. And then you import it. If I click on this, here's a big screenshot for a PL report. This is using the Cincinnati Seasonings data, but um, they all work the same. So if I keep scrolling down, I am going to get right here a link where it says download a copy of the profit and loss reporting template. And that link here, et cetera, et cetera, I'm going to click on it. I click on it. And you're going to Google Docs. And all you have to do is right here where it says in blue, download a copy of this spreadsheet by clicking on the Word file. Sometimes people will click on the icon for file, and then they'll send us a message that they need edit rights which of course we would never give you because that would be crazy because people would then make a mess and then it would be um totally out of control so instead what we would do is we say click on the word file in the top left corner if i do that and then i scroll down here to download as and i'm going to pick microsoft excel because anything can read an excel spreadsheet file there it is. It downloaded. Now I have this puppy on my computer and I can do anything I want. I can make any change I want because it's a spreadsheet on my computer. So here it is. Here's my copy now. And, you know, we suggest that you, for instance, strip out those rows there with the, you know, like strip out that. You don't need that. Just delete those rows, kind of clean it up, make it make it your own. Um, here's some notes here about, obviously, you, you see that this is set up for Cincinnati Seasonings and the early part of Cincinnati Seasonings before you even begin expanding and adding stores in Chicago and Columbus and Points West. But again, this is you know, Spreadsheets 101. When you when you use this for other case studies like the, the uh, collaborative supply chain right here, Expand it to accommodate new products and facilities. You know, for instance, add new columns to read and display the data for the facilities. Add new rows to read and display the data for products. There's some hints there. What it really comes down to, and again, I don't, I, I'm sure you all know this. Here we have two tabs, and I look here, I see the first tab, which is what's on screen right now. If I click on some of these numbers, I can see where it's reading, you know, or it's, a, it's, it's, here's the equation. Here's the macro, uh, you know, where are you getting that, those numbers? Okay. I click on that number right there. Okay. I can see that it's coming from simulation data, you know, row C uh, or cell C203. And look, here's the other tab on this spreadsheet. And here's my data that I downloaded and trimmed off to 30 days. So, that's all the instructions are there online for the collaborative supply chain. You'll need to do a little modification, but you can see how how the if you click around, you'll see how that all works. Um, when people you know say are you computer literate, you know, they always mean DNO, word processing, spreadsheets, PowerPoint, and email. That's basically what they mean. So we're assuming that this is something you it you can figure out pretty quickly, and that's why we have not um, done it for you. So Michael, you yes. Now? Yeah. Okay. Let me just supplement your uh, your answer with a couple points uh, for uh, not only ASCM 629, but also for ASCM 631. Uh, one, there should be two things that after a student completes their weekly assignment, they should be doing. One is to save the state, the, the finalized state that they uh, ran, uh, and give it a name so that they can know what they did um, as a completion for week two or week three or any of the other weeks. 
And then the other thing is they ought to be downloading uh, the data uh, for this purpose because uh, during week 10, uh, the expectation is that students will write a summary paper about what their accomplishments were and how they improved their supply chain during the um, spring term. And uh, as we all learn in business, uh, data drives uh, decisions. And so if you've got the data to prove or demonstrate how you made your improvements, uh, that's a, a key factor of the paper. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Michael. Well, so Mike, um, we do we do have a question that sort of dovetails to that right. uh, a little bit. Um, this uh, this person says, I did the Cincinnati seasoning simulation, ran it for 32 days without a break. Unfortunately, I did not write down step by step modifications I made to my supply chain operations. How do I get a detail of all of the changes I made? Well, that's what we call the mental model. Um, if the computer is the only thing that knows what's going on, we're all in big trouble, artificial intelligence or not. And when you start with Cincinnati Seasonings, it's, let's just take a quick look at the intro to Cincinnati. It's kind of an archetypal supply chain, relatively simple, but not simple-minded. And as it grows, it becomes more and more challenging. But when you start out, here's your model of that supply chain. And, and when I say mental model, it's the picture you need, you will develop as you work with the, any of these supply chains. So in, in Cincy, there's only uh, there's one factory, one warehouse or distribution center, and three stores to start. So your changes to you, the point about how do I know what I did? Well, look at your look at the model that you have today that ran for 33 days, and compare it to the model that you start out with, which is the one you could. You can still you can download a copy of it again from the library if you want, um, and you know that it had some problems right away. They are, you know, first of all, as as right now, as I, the first thing I do is, and you all have done this, we deliberately put three pitfalls into this model just to start engaging you and making you think. But there are many ways to solve each of these, and then. At, depending on the, the actions you take, you'll begin having other challenges that I could not predict because I can't predict what you'll do. But right right now I can see that at the end of two days I had this problem where I ran a, out of uh, space in Fort Wayne. There are many things I could do. I could deliver less product. I could add more space. I could, you know, I could do whatever I want. Um, what I'm going to do is in this particular case, maybe I'll just add more products and then it'll run again and it'll, there'll be some other problems, but what I'm going to do is I'll go back to my edit screen. I'm going to say, all right, Fort Wayne, this is the throwing money at the problem to get started in your first 30 days, and then you're going to have to circle back and make it more efficient. But, you know, my max storage capacity, I'll just, you know, add a whole lot more storage as if I had called up the local public warehouse and said, hey, I have an overstock situation. I need more storage. They'll make sure you have it. But that also means you'll pay for it as, as my rent cost will go up. So anyway, I've solved that problem. I go back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reload that supply chain. We'll get a few more days here. But you see what I'm doing is I'm making changes as I encounter these problems. So it's not like you have to necessarily write down, you know, at 0700, I added another truck. You know, you, know, you, you should have a sense of what you're doing. Uh, your boss in, in the real world will come walking into your office at the most unexpected times and say, what are you doing, right? And so <clears throat> that's all you need to be able to answer that question. What are you doing? Well, I'm adding more storage space to Fort Wayne, and I'm going to add another truck to Louisville. That's what you are keeping track of. And then when you download that data and run your P&L statement, and let me bring that up, and of course, depending on your data, depending on how you solve problems, when you run your P&L statement, it'll show you how well your solution is doing. It'll give you an objective way of comparing your solution to somebody else's. In this particular one right here, um, I lost $1.5 million in change. You can see that right there. Um, so there, obviously there are better ways to do things. Um, does that answer the question about how to keep track of changes? Uh, I think it does, Michael, and let me add one thing is that as students in the weekly discussions 
about what they did, uh, they should not be concerned if they come up with a slightly different solution than somebody else. Yes. Uh, the, the, everybody, based upon their own decision making, is going to make changes. And as Michael said a while ago, uh, some could be significantly different than others. The the end game is not necessarily did you do better than uh, student X, Y, or Z. Uh, it's did you solve the assignment, which is trying to get your network to run for 30 days, and then from week to week try to improve its performance. That's that's the real measure of success uh, for using this tool. And also, there's some KPIs. I mean, to Frank's point, it's not all about money. And uh, when you look at some of these key performance indicators here, these are some, some standard things that Sapache managers are always using. Obviously, inventory days of supply is probably always in, in someone's top three. Uh, when you look at, and we always hear this, you read it in your book, you hear it in your lectures, uh, you know, keep your inventory days of supply down low, turn and earn, whatever the heck that means. That means, you know, Turn over your inventory as fast as you can. That's how you earn money. And when you see inventory days of supply like 55.8, well, that's crazy. I mean, that's nuts. And, hey, guess what? That store is losing money, too. The other stores, because because it's got to rent a whole lot more storage space to support all of that stuff, plus your, you know, the money you, you have you use to purchase inventory now is, in effect, tied up. It's not paying rent. It's tied up in inventory. Etc. So when you look at some of these other stores and their days inventory of supply, you know, 3.3, 5.5, they could even be lowered a little bit more too. But certainly by looking at this, you get a sense of where you need to start focusing your attention. So these are what it is basically what you start to realize is operations and finance are two sides of the exact same coin. And I always I spent much of my career reporting to CFOs, so I always chafed under the financial oversight. But nonetheless, um, you do realize that two sides of the same coin. You can make operating decisions that will give you really good financial results as well. Other questions? Well, we do have one down here, um, which is a little bit. Uh, I mean, uh, you've you've provided the the end game there. Um, but it looks like someone wants to get a, a, a sort of when analyzing the data, yep. looking at the data sections that is on hand or demand. Right. Is there one that is more important than the other when analyzing the numbers and which data uh -huh. sections are critical sure. when making a, a supply chain decision? All right. All right, I'm going to start out with the favorite wishy-washy answer that I hate to hear from people, so I'm going to do it just for the thrill of it. And the answer is, it depends, doesn't it? It really does. There is no one perfect number. If there was, we'd all gravitate towards that, manage that, and the rest of the world would just float by. It really depends on what you're trying to do, where you are. Let's take a look. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to open up that spreadsheet. And I'm going to click on the Sim Data tab, and I can see that the data that is generated by the simulation is broken up into sections, so you can see what it is. So on-hand inventory, this is showing me, because we have 30 days worth of Sim data, and so in each of the facilities, here's my on-hand amount. Uh, my demand is held constant. <clears throat> Some people feel it should be variable. That's a Fine, but it'll be plenty challenging being held constant. And then production. We only have production happening at the factory. It also theoretically should be much more variable, but holding it constant is pretty good. And then the, here's what's coming in to each of your facilities. These are cumulative numbers, so subtract one from the other to get your dailies. What's going out, same thing. They're cumulative numbers, so you can subtract one from the other for your dailies. Uh, the same goes for your cost, which is both your operating cost and your rent cost. And again, they're cumulative. Uh, then here are your, here's your vehicles and the, the running cost for your vehicles. So you've got a lot of data to work with. And then here's what this does. This and you can change. I you know, thinking out of the box really means thinking out of the box. And you know, we're not saying you can cook the books and fool with the equations and lie to people, although I suppose you could. Hey, it's been done before. But you can come up with other 
ways of looking at these numbers. These are just some basic ideas for taking all of the simulation data, which is a lot. And basically, you know, we live and die in the business world month to month. You know, the third, so that's what we're doing here. Monthly P&L reports, you know, certainly in the real world, you'll be judged by, you'll have P&L reporting responsibilities. You'll be judged by your results. So this is an introduction to that if you're not already in that place. And I don't know what to tell you about what's the most important data. It really, really when, I, when I, for instance, when I look at this, this number here just keeps jumping out at me because it's such a large number. So I'm going to, I'm going to spend a lot of time looking at my inventory on hand number at first. Then I'm going to solve that. I'm going to get that under control by various methods. And then something else will become more important. Do you see what I mean? Zet, I hope that's not an entirely wishy-washy way to end that answer. Well, I don't think it is, Michael. But, you know, one of the other things uh, that you can do with data in an Excel spreadsheet is you can do charting. And you can yes. look at uh, over the period of a month whether the inventory at a facility is increasing, decreasing, or is basically level. Right. And the ideal situation is uh, for uh, if the, the, the real shortcut is to the maximum extent that you can try to keep things on a level basis yes. uh, is going to give you the better solution. Yes, and, and that's where you start to, and, um, you know, if I, if I open up the online guide, Notice all these things are in their own separate browsers. So once I have things open, I'm flipping back and forth. I'm not laboriously navigating back and forth. I'm just flipping on browser screen. So in, in the browser tab that has my, my Cincy intro or Kubernetes or combined intro or your collaborative intro, and I, you know, I kind of scroll down. I'm looking for one of those links there because I've scattered them liberally throughout. Uh, you'll always find them down here towards the bottom. Uh, where is that one for analyzing well, sim I'll data? Get all over it. I'll to go. And so, you know, looking at your simulation data, there's a lot yeah. of ideas for how to analyze this data right here. Yeah, there, there's your charts. There, here's some charts right here. Now, this comes from another case study <coughs> where there are three products, but it all means the same. If, if your lines are going, and look, at, we describe them here. Downward sloping line, what does that mean? Not enough product being delivered to meet demand. Upward sloping means the opposite. More product being delivered than is needed. Uh, sawtooth patterns. I mean, we All of these things mean something. So you start to get a sense of it. I think that some of you probably are getting a headache right now. I, you know, we designed this app. And in the first, <laughs> as we first started working with it, at least for me, I routinely got headaches. I, I, I thought to myself, what in heaven's name is going on here? Um, but it, it starts to click. And actually, Frank, um, some years ago, put together, I thought, a very well, well, uh, oh, I, I have it in, in, um, in Cincinnati. Let me show you. It, it was, you, you likened it, Frank, to a line dance. And I thought that was a really good analogy. And so I, I, uh, I you know, here's a picture. And if you, if you click on right there, you'll see Frank's, um, explanation of what this is like and i think this is a really good explanation that guy right there that's me you know with my thumb sticking up and you know and trying to figure out watching everyone else who doesn't know what they're doing either but at some point after you kind of get the hang of it you will be a pro it will click probably by about you know week three it, it should start to click and you're going i get it it's the four entities you know like a, a simple combination of those four there are many ways you can combine them, of course. And when that starts to happen, then you start to see how to use the simulations to try out different ideas. What if we did this? What if we sent two small trucks down there twice a day? Or what if we sent one big truck down there once a day? What would work better? The answer is simulate it and try it. The simulations will tell you what works better. So one thing, Michael, um, you've got about another 15 minutes to go. Um, as I mentioned earlier, people should be saving uh, their scenario at the end of each week because that's the scenario that they'll begin with for the following week. But they may want to make intermediate saves if they yeah. uh, want to try some of the things that you did. Uh, and also when they save it, uh, it creates a JSON file that they can, they can download and post uh, to their discussion to illustrate what they've done. So 
uh, a couple minutes on that would probably be helpful. Yes, and and what I'm doing right now is when you're in your account management screen, these four buttons, and one of them is save. So if I click on save next to you know my copy of Cincinnati Seasonings, and then maybe I've got my week one solution, which was get it to run for 30 days. So I'm giving it a name. I clicked on save. I'm giving it a name. I'm calling it week one solution. And then I'm clicking on save. And that's what, what creates a backup copy or what we call a save state. And there it is. There's my week one solution right there. I could download that now. If I say download, look, it downloads. And you can see it's a, it's a file that ends with a .json. So we call them JSON files. And if I want to send that to anybody else who is using SCM Globe or send a copy to Frank, I would now just send Frank an email, attach that JSON file to the email, and then when he gets it, he downloads it to his PC. There it is. Say I'm Frank now, and I want to see, well, what did you do? I can, I can both drag and drop, drop it right like that. Uh, if you don't have it, you know, right away visible in your browser, if you just click on the button that says upload a save file, it will open up a dialog box. It will show me. I know that, it, you know, it's in my download. So I don't know where you all have places where when you hit download, it'll download typically into a download file, but you may be changed. Whatever. You know where it is. And there it is. Week one solution. If I click on that, it'll upload it. So we just uploaded it again. And now I can see I've got two of them right down here. They have slightly different timestamps, actually, because the timestamps go out from more decimal places than we show you. But there they are. If I want to restore that, I click on Restore. Now I, I take it from a save state back to an active model. I can then, if I click on Edit, I can open it up. I can, I can look at it. I can make any changes I want. I can run simulations. So once you've sent me a copy, I can do whatever I want to it and then say, hey, I found some great, great ideas and made some improvements and send a copy back to you. So, you know, that, that's ways where you can start sharing ideas and building better solutions. The other thing that you can do when you're right in the middle of something, um, and you're, you're going to try a new change and you're not sure if it's going to work out. You don't have to go back to your account screen and break your train of thought. You can write from the edit screen. If I click on options, I can create a save state right there, and boom. It won't let me rename it. It'll just immediately save it. And so now I can go and do something which may not work out. There's no undo button here, but I've created a save state that I could quickly restore from. So those are the two ways that you can make backup copies. Great, Michael. Do we have any of them? Go we... ahead there, Steve. Any any other things in the any other questions in the chat box? Again, I I always say, what makes you feel uneasy? What is starting to give you a headache? Those are things you probably want to know more about, and silence will not excuse you from knowing the answer. <laughs> Okay, Natasha, can you show how you pulled the report up that had the daily? Um, what was that? I didn't quite read the whole thing, Steve. How did that? What was Natasha's question? Oh, here we go. That had the daily cost on it. The, the report. Yes, now, that's it. Okay, yep. so there are. You know, there's two kinds of data. Um, there's on screen, and what I'm going to do is I'll, uh, I'll I'll hit the simulation button here. And we'll just run this. This will probably run for about five days. And then we'll get a little bit of data. We can look at that. We we think that the best way at first, certainly in in the, the challenge to just get it to run for 30 days, don't worry about downloading your data. As a matter of fact, it's pointless, really, to download your data until you do get 30 days and you can start creating a whole month's P&L statement. Um, so on the way to 30 days, first, just do whatever you think you need to do. And that's why we have these on-screen data displays to help you um, as we build up a, a day. Or, you know, so you can start to see the on-hand inventory amount. If I click on vehicles, I'm seeing the running vehicle no. costs. If no. I click on products, 
I can see where the products are, where they're building up, where they're running out. The console data is the simulation data that you want 30 days, 30 plus days of before you download. Um, so as I click through, you know, if I look at the different facilities, I can see what's going on there. You know, like I, <clears throat> you can see where you're running out of product. You can see where you have too much product, like in Indy, you know, if the line's going up, too much product. Um, and then eventually we run into this problem here in Louisville. So that's what you're going to be doing for us. You're going to be using the on-screen displays. And there's a lot of data there. And we don't think that it will do you any good uh, to dive into the details until you've at least got your supply chain to run for 30 days and you can generate a P&L statement and some KPIs. And then you can start getting much more analytical. You can be as analytical as you want. But until you get that first 30 days, and in the process of getting 30 days, you're going to learn a lot about how to use the software. I think the software, we've designed the software so that it becomes, quote, intuitively obvious, you know, once you get the hang of a, a Texas two-step, which is actually not that easy. I know. I've tried. But once you get the hang of it, the software fades, hopefully becomes transparent, and now you're, try you're really thinking about the supply chain itself. Where do I want to put my trucks? How do I want to schedule my deliveries? How much should I deliver? What kind of vehicle should I be using? There's a lot to think about. And this is a relatively su simple supply chain. So that's what all this on screen is about. Don't go, don't be worrying about downloading data until you get 30 days, 30 plus days. Is that, did that answer the question? I think it did, Michael. And uh, one thing you might demonstrate also is how you change uh, a vehicle schedule. You know, sure. basically yes. what you're doing is you're setting up a departure and then a period of time between departures right. uh, to uh, set up uh, your your trucking runs. So the first thing is, like in Cincinnati, all the the actually in in consolidate in. in on the collaborative supply chains as well. We've chosen to base most of our vehicles at the distribution center in what is called a hub and spoke distribution model where the hub is the DC and the spokes are the delivery routes that fan out to the stores from the DC. So when I, and I know that I've got a, when I'm looking for where are the vehicles in this supply chain, if I click on a, on a, on a uh, facility and I don't see any routes emanating from that facility, I know there's no vehicles there. When I click on one like the DC, and I see, oh, look, yeah. So I know there are vehicles there. Now I'm going to click on vehicles, and I'm going to you know, pick one, like truck number two. Now this delay between departures is how, in, in this academic version of the software, we don't give you the ability to say every Friday and, and Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock we want this truck to run. Um, in the Enterprise Edition... That, that that feature will be there. But what you do have is this delay between departures. So what that means is <clears throat> it's gonna this this vehicle will run its route, return to the DC, wait for 20 hours, and then run again. And if I take a look at the route itself, I can see something about it. I can see that we have it's taking, you know, 3.8 hours, about four hours uh, to run that route. I can see here's the round trip distance. And I already said what the speed of the truck is. So therefore, I know what the round trip time is. If I want this, this, if I want to basically have this truck making a daily delivery, in other words, once every 24 hours, well, the route itself takes about four hours. So therefore, I make the delay between departure to be 20. So that means that it runs the route, which is about four hours. It comes back. It waits 20 more hours. There's my 24 hours. So I'm getting a once a day delivery there. What would I do? Open question. What would I do if I want to double the rate of delivery for this truck? If I want to run twice a day, not once a day, what would I do? I'm sure so. I, I just heard a thought bubble from one of you, and you said, yes. you said, make it 10. You said, cut that delay be, be, between departures in half. So that's absolutely right. I make it 10. Now it's going to run twice as often. You see what I mean? What if I wanted to make it run, you know, four times as often? Okay, then I make it five, right? It's, it's just like that. Say, okay. Michael, Timothy yeah. had a specific question. Yeah, he has a specific question, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Well, go yeah. ahead. And, you go ahead and read it, Steve. Okay. He um, he he's asking about the factory, and he's asking you to click on it and look at the right. on hand quantity. Right. He he asks why is it on a steady increase if seasonings are being removed and taken uh -huh. to the distribution center? Uh -huh. Well, what would happen if I am? And here, what we we're gonna we're gonna look at the factory, and then we're also <coughs> gonna go back here. We'll go back to Cincinnati Seasonings, and, well, actually, there's a hundred ways to find it, but I'm looking for that thing called Analyzing Simulation Data. There is one way I found it, and <coughs> I look here. Upward sloping lines mean more products being delivered or manufactured than needed to meet demand. That is the answer. Yes. We are taking product out of there, but we must be delivering. Well, this is the factory. We must be either. Well, the factory is where we're making it. So what this tells me is I'm making more product than I am pulling out of the factory to deliver to the DC. And when I look at the DC, my on hand is going down. So what this means is I'm pulling more product out of the DC to deliver to stores that I'm receiving in deliveries from the factory. Does that make sense? Yeah, more specifically, Michael, it was saying, uh, Timothy was saying, even though my deliveries from the factory were more than I was producing, mm -hmm. the on-hand quantities at the factory continued to increase. No, that, that's not so. It didn't happen that way. Uh, you made a mistake somewhere. I'm, I mean, call me a liar. Absolutely prove me wrong. Um, but uh, I doubt that. Uh, there is something you did wrong. Look at your numbers. And the way to look at your numbers is, um, number one, you could actually, you could send me your supply chain, and I'll take a look at it. Um, I'm always interested when, when people find bugs, and maybe you have found a bug, but I doubt it. But I will pay you $10.25 if you have found a bug. So please... I would love it if you would go to your edit screen or actually, you know, go to your my account screen and your version of, you know, create a save state, <coughs> download it and send it to me. M Hugo said scmglobe.com. All right. So Timothy added, uh, please click on the seasonings factory and look at the on hand quantity. Right. Why is it on a steady increase if seasonings are being removed and taken to the distribution center? I, I guess he's trying to well, refocus. Because we're making more product at the factory than you're pulling out of it. That's why. So you need to cut production then is what you're suggesting? I, I, there's a couple things that you should be. And again, this is as you peel the, the layers of this onion, you're gonna, you can learn more and more. I don't want to have you try to learn everything all at once. But for instance, Look at this. Here's another one of these fascinating links that I put in right there. I wonder what I would do if I want to learn about cutting inventory and operating costs. Well, there's an idea right there. If I also look in my vertical menu, I will find something under supply chain modeling logic called also. And so if I click on that, here's some things you can consider when you start to, well, first you get it to run for 30 days, then you start to make it run more efficiently for 30 days. And, here are some things to think about. One of the things you're going to find out is that you should synchronize factory production with your total store demand. If you add up your total store demand when it's when you first start out with Cincinnati seasonings, you'll find that it's 190 uh, cases of Cincinnati seasonings per day when you look at the demand across all the factory uh, all the stores. Well, what is my factory making right now? If I if I go and click on the factory, I can see that we are making our production rate is 350, right? So I'm producing too much. And it would be, that, but this is the sort of stuff that you discover as you work with the model. I have, and I know there must be bugs in the code. We also, by the way, have found five bugs that are, Describe that each have a workaround. They're in the FAQs, which is we always say, read the FAQs, please, please, please. 
Uh, there are only five bugs that we're aware of. We're actually working on fixing them as we speak. But none of them are in the simulation logic. They're all in the editing, you know, when you set up your model. In the simulation logic, it's been run thousands of times over the last five years. Uh, we think we have given a pretty rigorous testing. I doubt very much that there is a problem in the math of the simulation. I often will find something which I think must be a bug, but then when I start looking through the data and going, you know, day by day, just downloading the raw data and picking a facility, looking at the, at the receipts and the, you know, the disbursements, um, sometimes you're going to find things that seem counterintuitive and you just go, that couldn't be right. That's impossible. And all I can say is look at the data, pick a facility, look at what comes in, look at what goes out day by day. You can, you can track it just by looking at the raw data. You know, if I open up my, my spreadsheet here and I just look at the raw data, I mean, it's there. If all of those who are into forensic accounting, you can do some heavy forensics on this. And if you find a bug, please do tell us. And I, I will immediately send you a check for $10.25 and we'll fix that bug. But we have not found any bugs in the simulation logic over the last five years. Um, so. That said, you do have um, known bugs and that's yes. in your user guide too. Yes. There, if you click on, you know, if you're, if you click on the FAQs, and we, and we, there are not 110 FAQs like you often find on sites, which I find completely useless. There are seven, only seven. You will all encounter some or most of these, so you will need to know the answers to these. Over again, over the last five years, thousands of people. These are the seven questions that are most frequent, and then known issues and bugs. We've already fixed number five. We're going to roll that into production at the end of the week. Uh, we're working on number two now, which can be a pesky little thing. Uh, but here they are. <clears throat> so here's a description of the bug, and then there's always a workaround. So none of these bugs is just going to have you stop dead in the water, can't do anything as well. Um, but you will probably run into some of these bugs. So you know, that, that's, here's your answers. Uh, and the bugs are inexcusable, and we're trying to get rid of them, but, gee, we're doing the best we can. All right, other questions? Uh, I I don't see any more, Mike, and I think right. we're out of time. Yeah, I think, we, I think we are. So, again... If you do run into technical problems, if you feel that frustration rising, please, if you're in the, in the app, look in the upper right corner. All your navigation buttons are always in the upper right corner. Click on Help. If you're in Help, be sure that you click on the FAQs. You're probably going to get the answer you're looking for. I, it's always amazing. People will spend hours on this and get really angry, and then they'll they'll hit the Support button and send us you know a blazing email. And I can appreciate that you're pissed off, but just check out the seven answers here. You're going to, and then there are the five bugs. So that's the first thing to do. Otherwise, we're always glad to hear from you wherever you are in any of the screens in the, in the, uh, you know, in the online guide, there's the get in touch or contact us. So please do that. We'll be back to you. If it's during the day, we'll be back to you within a couple hours. It, you know, if it's later at night, it may take a little bit longer, but we'll get back to you within 24 hours. Thank you, Michael and Steve, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.